Well, I thank you for your diligence this morning. Again, I thank you, Don. Thank you for the choir. You all know me. I am not going to stretch out our worship service today. But I'm going to ask you just to take a few minutes. Open your hearts and listen to what the Holy Spirit of God has to say to us this morning through the speaking of His words through His Spirit. We're going to be over in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, looking at the first seven verses. If you're able to stand this morning and read in God's Word, we invite you to do so. Chapter 2, verse 1 begins to read as following. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census was taken place while Cornelius was governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up to Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his bestowed or engaged wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her first son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, lied him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. May God now receive a blessing upon the reading and hearing of this word and may be seated. Now as I was reading that scripture, some of my Sunday school classes were smiling because we looked at the 13 misconceptions of Christmas this morning. Christmas. We've heard it for years. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Or is it? What does Christmas really mean to you? Is it possible that perhaps we have got caught up in the materialism of Christmas that we have missed the true meaning of Christmas? Could it be that we have become so busy during this time of the year that we have truly missed Jesus, who is the reason that you and I celebrate Christmas. Because without a doubt, as we enter into Christmas tomorrow, Jesus is going to be missed. He's going to be missed in our nation. He's going to be missed around the world. He's even going to be missed in the lives of some of his children. And he's going to be missed in some churches. In the midst of it all, I firmly believe that it's this time of the year that we could lose focus of why we celebrate Christmas. It's this time of the year that we get caught up, do we not? We get caught up in all the activities of Christmas. I would assume, even in my own, we're going to rush home and prepare meals either today or tomorrow. For most of us, we're going to work ourselves to death. And about 11 or 12 o'clock tonight, or for some earlier, we're going to go, Phew, I'm so glad today is over. Could it be that in the midst of all of this, as we begin to open presents and receive and give, that we miss out on the true meaning of Christmas. We miss out on the person of Jesus Christ. May I remind us, church, the only reason that we are here, the only reason we celebrate Christmas is because of Jesus. Amen. You know, missing Jesus is not something new. It can be traced all the way back to the first century. And I want to show you this morning a group of three people in the first century who missed Jesus at Christmas. I believe it is possible 
that we could fall into one of these two groups. And if we're not careful, even to this very hour, and even tomorrow as we enter into Christmas Day, we too can miss Jesus at Christmas. <laughs> the first group of people who miss Jesus are those who have no room for him. Now, Scripture says that the first person who missed Jesus, please note this, his name was the innkeeper. Now, the innkeeper is not mentioned anywhere in Scripture. We would assume that it's speaking of the person who is in charge of the inn that day. In verse 7 of the, birth, of the chapter we just read, it says, For she shall bring forth her firstborn son, wrap him in swaddling clothes, lie him in a manger, because there is no room in the inn. Now, I believe if whoever this innkeeper was, if they knew that that baby was going to be the Messiah, if that baby was going to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I believe they would have made room for them. Writers tell us at that time of the year that Bethlehem was crowded. Remember over in... Uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 2, and here they, they had the census, and everybody had to uh, go back to their land and register. That's where Mary and Joseph were going. They were heading back to Bethlehem. There he was going to register them both. But as they began to approach Bethlehem, they found that it was very crowded. Writers tell us the people were all over the streets. They were lined up that day because it was tax season. Now, it won't be long. You all know what tax season is. It's just around the corner. And our wonderful people, Kim and uh, Jesse, who's up in the tax assessor's office, and if I missed anybody else, maybe Christina down the road, you know, you, you understand what's coming. It's a busy time of the year for the county. It was a busy time of the year. And I'm sure that you're aware of it, that as you go out, if you go out to shop today, God bless you, <laughs> you're going to run into crowds of people, unless you're like me and you stay home. And as you enter into these places that are crowded, with the rudeness of society that we live in, Somebody's going to step in front of you. If not, they have already stepped in front of you. You know, here's my opinion. You know, I used to get worked up over all that. You know what my opinion is now? If someone needs to be that big of a hurry, let them go ahead and go. Can you imagine how crowded it was that day? And for some reason, we don't know why. But the innkeeper said, there is no room here for you. They crowded out that day from their hearts and their lives, whoever it was, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They made no room for Jesus. And I want to tell you this morning, church, we can sit here and we can say, oh, I can't believe they would do that. Didn't they know it was the Messiah? Didn't they know it was Jesus? Couldn't they found somewhere to put them? Didn't they know that it was the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament? Didn't they know if they would allow Jesus to come into the end, things would change? Because when Jesus gets into your heart, things change. Amen. When Jesus is part of your life, your family change. Your life changes. Amen. Your church changes. Everything about you changes. Do you realize, has it ever thought to you, 
what kind of business the innkeeper would have had later on <laughs> if he would have put a sign on the outside of the inn saying, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was born here. Can you imagine what would have happened if he would have said, up in room three, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the coming Messiah, was born in that room? How many people do you think would have wanted that room? Yet the innkeeper had no room for Jesus. Does that typify your life? Does that describe your life? That you have no room for Jesus? Do you have any space at all for Jesus? Are you off your throne and Jesus is on your throne of your life? Are you giving him his rightful place? He wants to be number one in your heart. He wants to be number one in your life. He wants to be number one in every aspect of who you are and who you hope to be. The innkeeper had no room for Jesus. Now, business was good that day, I'm sure, but Jesus was missed because the innkeeper had no room. And I want to tell you, church, if we're not careful, in the next day or two, we also can get caught up in all the activities of Christmas. And Jesus can be missed. We can push Jesus aside for the activities of life that is ahead of us. Have you ever thought about this? How can you have a birthday party without the person's birthday? <laughs> How can you and I celebrate Christmas without Jesus? The first person who missed Jesus was the one who had no room for Jesus. The second person I see in Scripture who missed Jesus is found over in Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. It was King Herod. It reads this. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Not only he, but all of Jerusalem with him. Her what? In verse 2 of that chapter, it says, The wise men ask him, Where is the king of the Jews? Well, this troubled him. <laughs> Matter of fact, that word trouble comes from the Greek word throne. It means agitated, it means frustrated, it means angry. You ever been frustrated? You ever been angry? You ever been agitated? I mean, he was angry. And the king said, what do you mean you're looking for the king? I'm the king. You're, you're looking at the king. Why are you looking for someone who's already here? You know what Herod's problem was? I believe it could be the problem that so many people have today. He had no room for two kings in his life. Because when you decide to be king of your life, master of your life, when you decide that you're going to control and be captain of your own ship, you crowd Jesus out. And you become controller of your life. You know what I'm finding about people? They don't mind having Jesus around. As long as they don't become ruler of their life. They don't mind having Jesus around as long as Jesus is not telling them what to do. People don't like to be told what to do. Have you ever noticed that? But if Jesus is going to be number one and he's going to sit on the throne of your life, then he has to be in control. You can't have two masters. Even Jesus was aware of this. He writes in Matthew chapter 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. He said, you're either going to hate one or love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. 
See, listen to me, church. Christians, we can't be worldly and spiritually at the same time. That's like trying to mix water and oil. It doesn't happen. You can't be popular with the ungodly and popular with God at the same time. You can't have your affections upon the things of the world and upon God at the same time. You can't walk with the beat of the world one day and then walk with the beat of God's message the other day. The Bible says we as Christians, we are to seek heavenly treasures, not earthly. Jesus. One way that we can miss him is whenever he's not king of our lives. Whenever we are sitting upon the throne instead of him. You know, some people are troubled with that. Some people have a problem with Jesus being number one, controlling their life. You know why? Because they don't want someone telling them what to do. They don't want to have to submit their lives to someone. They don't want competition. Here they want any competition. People don't want Jesus to interfere with their lives. But if you're a child of the living God, and if Jesus is number one in your life, then he's going to interfere with your life. Yes. Amen. I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm kept by the grace of God. But I grow because of the grace of God. Amen. God continues to work and mold and work in us. But people just don't want Jesus to interfere. Oh, I'll come to Sunday and I'll sit in the pew, but oh, Jesus, don't interfere. <coughs> don't you interfere in my life. Don't you interfere in my finances. Don't you interfere in my position of life. Oh, leave my ambitions and dreams alone. Herod was troubled. <coughs> Not only does it say Herod was troubled, it says all of Jerusalem with him. See, when Jesus shows up, and he is rejected something's going to happen Herod was troubled because he had rejected Jesus and I believe the reason that so many people today have problems in their lives in their homes with their children is because they have rejected Jesus Look, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I can solve the world's problems with one name. His name is Jesus. Amen. Our problem today is because we have rejected Jesus. We have too many people who want to be king instead of Jesus being king of their lives. See, people, they don't care if Jesus even comes in the vicinity of their lives. Just don't sit on my throne. I'll come to church. I'll give to the church. I'll work in the church. But oh God, don't rule over my life. And if that defines your life, you are missing the true reason that we celebrate Christmas. If Jesus cannot direct your pathway, you are missing the true reason why we celebrate Christmas. If Jesus cannot tell you no in one year when the enemy is whispering yes in the other year, then you are missing Christmas. You're only celebrating yourself. Herod didn't want any competition. I, I don't know about you, but I don't like competition. I, I like to win at all board games. <laughs> Unless you go to John's house and John, he's got it rigged and he's going to win. That. <laughs> but we don't like competition, do we? We don't like anyone competing for our spot in life. We don't want anyone else sitting on our throne. But the Bible declares to us that Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He wants to sit on the throne of your life. He wants to be in charge. And he said, if you don't allow him to be King and ruler of your life, 
then you are missing the true reason why we celebrate Christmas. And I believe today it could be that he's telling some of us it's time to get off the thrones of our lives and allow Jesus once again to be number one. Make room for Jesus. And maybe you're saying, well, preacher, that's pretty good. You keep talking to him. I heard a guy the other day, a preacher. I won't tell you his name, but I kind of like him. But he was talking about, he read the scripture. He says, wives submit to their husbands. And he stopped. He didn't say anything for a while. And he says, and then, you know what? He goes, I, I know. I know what some of you men are thinking right now. Give it to him, Paul. Set him straight, Paul. You, you tell him, Paul. And maybe up to this point, that's what you've been saying. Preacher, you tell him. You set him straight. And then he went on to say, hold on. I'm coming around to the rest of you. Yes. <laughs> And I want to close with this last point. <clears throat> How can we miss Jesus at Christmas whenever we are religious instead of righteous? Amen. Whenever we have religion, but we don't have a relationship. I believe in the Bible we miss this there's a group of people who miss Christmas, that first Christmas. They were the religious people. In a sense, they were the church. And maybe you're saying, preacher, how can you go to church and miss Christmas? How can you go to church and miss Jesus? So Herod struggled. Scripture says he, he calls together the religious people. He knew they knew the Bible. And he said, where is Jesus going to be born? He went to the religious heresy of that day. And he called upon them for an answer. He knew the scribes would be the most helpful because they spent the most time studying scripture. He said, where is this Christ going to be born? Notice in Matthew chapter 2, he even calls it the Christ. He didn't say baby. He said Christ. I believe he had some knowledge of this coming Messiah. He had some knowledge of the Christ, or he wouldn't have called him the Christ, the anointed one, which was prophesied in the Old Testament. So he goes to these religious leaders, those who knew the Bible, those who went to church. He says, tell me, where is this Christ going to be born. Notice in Matthew chapter 2 verse 5. So they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea for thus it is written prophesied by the prophet. This is referring to uh, Micah 5 2. 700 years before Matthew 2 ever took place. 700 years before Jesus was ever born. Micah prophesied the Christ the Messiah the Redeemer, the Anointed One, will be coming to Bethlehem. Bethlehem. What do we know about Bethlehem? Not much. If you were to ask someone, where do you think you would want Jesus to be born? It wouldn't have been Bethlehem. Bethlehem had no significance of that day. Now some people may wonder, preacher, why are you so stuck on Christmas? Why are you so stuck on the Bible? I want to tell you something. If someone can predict 700 years ago what I'm going to do tomorrow, I'm going to believe that person. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Micah prophesied. And I want to tell you, my friends, it came to the fulfillment of Scripture. <laughs> And I believe that all scripture is an errant word of God. Free from error. But I don't want you to miss this. These religious people, they knew the scripture. They had the head knowledge of Jesus. 
And when Herod asked them, where is he going to be born? They knew exactly where he was going to be born. But notice this. They never made the trip. Now, come on. If I'm religious, and I know the Redeemer, the Messiah, the prophesied one is going to be born, I'm going to go see him. I was getting cold anyway. <laughs> I, I was getting cold too. <laughs> See, they had the knowledge of the Bible, but they didn't have Jesus. A lot of folks like that nowadays too. That is 100%. And I believe that's where we need to be careful. And then we have the non-biblical non people, the non-biblical scholars... Those who probably didn't have any formal training on the Bible, those who probably didn't have that much knowledge of the Bible, they're the ones that went. Yet the church people didn't go to Bethlehem. They didn't make the trip. They had the head knowledge. But they didn't have Jesus in their hearts. And I want to tell you today, church, you can sit in this church Sunday after Sunday, you can know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You can quote it backwards and forward, which I can't. You can look as dedicated and committed, and you can give every dime that you have to this church. But I want to tell you something. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it's just religion. It's not a relationship. Amen. And when you get to the gates of heaven, God's going to say, for I do not know you. Depart from me. And I think that's where we need to be very, very good. The Word. The Word. It's more than head knowledge. It's heart knowledge. Now, Miss Judy, I love Miss Judy because of her wisdom. But her hair, because I say grace wisdom, it's in the Bible. It's a sign of wisdom if you don't know that. And it's in the Bible. Read, read the book of Proverbs. <coughs> and I've heard people say this, and I've heard people say this in this church. The older I get, the greater desire I have for Jesus. I've been preaching a long time. Sometimes I feel like too long. But the more that I study, the more I understand that I don't know. There, there's so much wisdom in this book that we have to spend time in it studying it. But you all, as much as that is, that's not going to get you to heaven. Alan Carr says this. It's better to know less and find Jesus than to know more and miss Jesus. He says the purpose of the written word is to lead you to the living word. The Bible quoting people of that day, they knew the Bible, but they never had a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Unless the written word draws you you'll never be saved. Unless the written word draws you, you'll never be born again. <coughs> you'll never find eternal life. And you can go through all the motions of worship that you want to go through. And ladies, you look beautiful, and guys, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> but sitting in a few of this church and come Sunday and I get you that. I've heard this for all my life. Oh, preacher, rapture of the church can happen any time. <laughs> I've been so selfish over the years, I, I have to admit. I said, oh, oh, please, just let me get through Bible school. <laughs> you know, just, I put a lot of time, let me get this bachelor's degree out of the way, please, Lord, just let me. And then I said, oh, please, uh, let me get married. And oh, God, let me have kids. You know what I'm asking for now? 
Let me see the grandkids. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. But sometimes we can be selfish. Can we not? And as much as I love coming to church, giving to the church, helping people in the church, it means nothing without Jesus. Jesus has to be right here. I would rather know nothing about the Bible and have Jesus here than know all the Bible and miss Jesus. And there's a day coming, you all. I, I, I believe it. I believe, I believe we're getting closer. As I study the end of times and I study the events of end of times, I, I believe we're really getting closer because we can't continue on the the course economically, financially, and religiously that we're heading on now. And politically, we can't. It, somewhere it's going to just, it's going to hit heads. And I don't want to be Bible ready. I want to be Jesus ready. That's right. Amen. And, and you have to ask yourself this morning, has the written word Draw you to the living word. Are you saved? Are you born again? Yes. Tonight, we have our wonderful time of opening our Christmas gifts. Now, I don't know how your family does it. I'm, I'm not here to talk my family, but our family has a very unusual tradition. We open one present at a time, and we go around the circle. <laughs> I'm not a drinking man, but you know, some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is ever going to get over me. And then finally, halfway through, Marin, come on, get tired of it. They just start lifting everything up. And, yeah. and then tomorrow, some of you will be opening gifts. Some of you will get what you want. Some of you will not get what you want. Now, Dad over here, he keeps a list and he writes down everything that he don't get. <laughs> but look, out of all the gifts that somebody can give you, if you don't know Jesus today, I want to offer you the greatest gift. <laughs> Allow the written word to bring you into the living word, which is Jesus. But this don't make salvation so difficult. It's not difficult. The Bible says if you acknowledge that you're a sinner, the Bible says if you repent of your sins, turn from your sinfulness, and ask Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, you will be saved. So today, if you don't know Jesus, can I encourage you to find him? before you leave this place. If you do know Jesus, can I ask you, let's don't get so caught up in the Christmas this year that we miss Jesus. Pause tomorrow and remember why we celebrate Christmas. I know Jesus wasn't born on the 25th, but that's when we celebrate his birth. So let's just pause tomorrow and take a moment and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And allow him to be number one in our lives. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. One of the most important things that you can do today <laughs> is to make sure that you're right with God. You have to search your heart in your mind and you have to ask yourself, if I stood before God right now, would everything in my life be pleasing to him? First of all, have I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior? And second of all, am I living the life of holiness that God has called me and equipped me to live? If not, this is your hour. As she plays, if the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to you, be obedient. We're not here to embarrass anybody today. 
We're here to make sure that you have everything right with God. You step out and you come as you please. Somebody here with your eyes closed and the head is bowed. Nobody's looking. You just want to raise up your hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. God bless you. God bless you. Pray for strengthening. Preacher, I need strengthening. God bless you. I need comfort. God bless you. I need healing. God bless you. I need you to be number one in my life. Oh, God bless you. Oh, Father, what a joy it has been today to be here in your presence. As we depart from this place today, may we take the love of Jesus, the greatest gift of all, and share it with those who don't know you as Lord and Savior. Be with us now as we depart from this place. Bring us back at your appointed time. And all of God's people said, Amen.